now that I've reclaimed my message from the sound booth, I can feel free to start. Uh, this is a good day. I love Pentecost Sunday. Uh, I love the idea of the Holy Spirit being poured out on us even more than what we may already feel or claim. I want you to believe the promise that the power of the Holy Spirit, right, that raised Jesus from the dead is living inside of you right now if you have claimed God's grace and forgiveness through Jesus Christ on the cross. Amen? And that Holy Spirit emboldens us to go out and to proclaim His message wherever we go, in our words, in our actions, in our lives, in our thoughts. We are emboldened to go out and live the life that Jesus wants us to live for Him. And it's the Holy Spirit that gives us the power to do that. As we start today, we are on Article of Faith number 6. It's the Atonement. This is one of my favorite uh, doctrines of the church. And again, this is a doctrine that, that really is pretty uh, broad across all denominational lines. So I'm not going to tell you anything that another church wouldn't tell you about the atonement. But the way that it plays out in the life of a person who uh, believes that they have free will to choose to follow God, this atonement is great news because it gives us a reason to say yes to Jesus. Amen? And so we're going to talk about that today, but I want to start with a story. Uh, many people believe that this is a true story, and I have no reason to doubt uh, that it is actually true, that there just isn't any hard evidence, it's not in a book or anything like that to prove it. Uh, but the, pow uh, the power of a good story is that it lasts generation after generation as it gets passed down uh, through those people. And, and so here we're going to tell you a story about the former New York City mayor, Fiorello LaGuardia. Anyone flown through LaGuardia Airport? It's named after uh, this fellow, their former mayor back in the 1930s. Uh, in the middle of the Great Depression, this New York City mayor, Fiorello LaGuardia, strived to live with the people. It was not unusual for him to ride with firefighters, to raid with the police, or to take field trips with orphans. On a bitterly cold night in January of 1935, this mayor turned up at a night court that served the poorest ward of the city. LaGuardia dismissed the judge for the evening and took over the bench himself. Within a few minutes, a tattered old woman was brought before him charged with stealing a loaf of bread. She told the mayor that her daughter's husband had left, her daughter was sick, and her two grandchildren were starving. <clears throat> However, the shopkeeper from whom the bread was stolen refused to drop the charges. It's a really bad neighborhood, Your Honor, the man told the mayor. She has got to be punished in order to teach other people around here a lesson. LaGuardia sighed. He turned to the woman and said, I've got to punish you. The law makes no exceptions. Ten dollars or ten days in jail. But even as he pronounced the sentence, the mayor was already reaching into his own pocket. He extracted a bill and tossed it into his famous hat, saying, Here is the $10 fine which I now remit, and furthermore, I am going to fine everyone in the courtroom 50 cents for living in a town where a person has to steal bread so that her grandchildren can eat. Mr. Bailiff, collect the fines and give them to the defendant. The following day, New York City newspapers reported that $47.50 was turned over to a bewildered woman who had stolen a loaf of bread to feed her starving children. Fifty cents of that amount was contributed by the grocery store owner himself, while some 70 petty criminals, people with traffic violations, and New York City policemen, each of whom had just paid 50 cents for the privilege of doing so, gave the mayor a standing ovation. Now that's a powerful story, and it illustrates the difference between two key terms that we're going to talk about today, and that's mercy and grace. You have probably heard that mercy is when we don't get what we deserve. Many times mercy is used to refer to not getting the punishment we deserve. 
children, uh, or, or maybe even adult boys, uh, play this game called Mercy, right? Anyone ever played that game, Mercy? Uh, when you try to bend each other's hands over backwards, and then when someone yells Mercy, the game is over. Uh, and so just for fun, I've asked uh, a couple guys to come up and display what it is to play the game of Mercy. So uh, I asked Cameron, and he was going to find an opponent, and I'm, I'm pretty, pretty shocked who he picked. You guys? Oh, he's going to pick Sean? Okay. I was told it was going to be someone different. That's right. I think Cameron might have got a little scared. That's right. That's right. Hey. Oh, see. So now our insurance is up to date, but I don't want you guys to break anything. Okay? So someone needs to yell mercy. Don't let this go on forever. Okay? <laughs> All right. So go ahead. You guys, you can stand up on stage so everyone can see you. Okay? What's that? Yeah, this, 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 this is the leadership of something seeming to be determined here. Yeah. All right, Mark said go. Oh, it's exciting. It's exciting. Come on, you got twist. There you go. You guys see? I'm going to move this. Yeah. <laughs> Someone's got to do something. Oh, there we go. Uh, I feel like we need a referee to call stalemate. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, that could have been, could have been interesting. <laughs> Destiny and Brianna could have put on a show for us, I'm sure. Yeah, you got to do something. This is supposed to be, yeah, exact stalling, yeah. Point. There's no point. Someone's got to win. Don't break the keyboard. Make a move. Come on. Twist. Cameron, twist. Okay, I'm calling it over. It's done. Good job. Shake hands. Yeah. That's right. I'm a little disappointed, but that's all right. Maybe they're just evenly matched. I used to play that with my brother all the time, and I, man, I, I hurt him too much. And I wouldn't play with him now because he's big, and we'd break something. But the point is, if one of them had been able to get the other to yell out mercy, then at that point, the person who's in the dominant position gets to make a choice. Are they going to allow the mercy to be given, or are they going to go in for the kill and snap that wrist in half, right? If they had the ability. I don't know if you guys had that ability, but that's all right. The point is, the person with the authority, the person with the dominant position has a choice to make when it comes to granting mercy. And so in this story, this story illustrates the mercy uh, when, when Mayor LaGuardia paid the fine for the woman. She did not deserve that. The mayor was in a dominant position, and he granted mercy and forgiving that debt. Justice was served, though, when the fine was paid. And mercy reigned because the woman could not pay the fine herself. So LaGuardia paid it for her. Mercy is when we don't get what we deserve. She deserved jail. Or she deserved to pay the fine herself. And she didn't end up having to do that. Grace, on the other hand, is when we get what we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting the bad things that we do deserve. Grace is is about getting the good things that we don't deserve. The grace shown in this story was not the forgiveness of the dead, right? God's grace is not that He forgives us. That's His mercy. The grace is in the extra assessment of that 50 cents uh, that every person had to pay in a fine. The grace was the $47.50 that this woman received. forty-seven fifty that she did not deserve. And as Christians, we understand the mercy part is the forgiveness of sins, the removal of the punishment. That's God's mercy. Praise God. We deserve eternal death and separation from God because we are sinners. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. That's what we deserve. Mercy is the forgiveness of those sins and the removal of the punishment. Grace, receiving what we don't deserve, is the gift of of new life, the gift of right relationship with God, the gift of eternal life in heaven. Amen? 
The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, the Bible says. But there's still one more element that is needed. Justice must still be served, both in this story and in our lives. We know that God is a just God. And justice is not simply dismissed in the interest of grace and mercy. If Mayor LaGuardia had simply forgiven the fine, then the shopkeeper would have received no compensation for the stolen loaf of bread. And so Mayor LaGuardia had mercy on the woman and still provided justice for the shopkeeper. Paul talks about the justice of God in Romans chapter 3. Let's read 3, 21 through 26 together. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Do you see all those times where it talks about having faith and believing? The belief and the faith is a huge part of our salvation. The atonement comes. Christ blood as the atonement comes and we're going to get into this in a second and it's full it is it is everything that we need but yet we still have to believe amen christ's blood is good enough for all it is big enough for all but you still have to believe you have to have faith we learn here in these passage, in that passage, that God is a just God. And at the same time, He is a merciful God. God cannot contradict His own nature. So He could not sacrifice His justice for the sake of mercy. And He will not sacrifice His mercy in favor of justice. We understand that God must be fully just and fully merciful. So he made the only move that he could make to release us from our bondage to sin. He gave us his son as the atonement for our sins. And this part is so cool. God did not simply have mercy on us. He went ahead and paid the debt that we could not pay. He did this through what we call the atonement. Let's read this. Uh, Let me read this for you here. The atonement, our sixth article of faith. We believe that Jesus Christ, by his sufferings, by the shedding of his own blood, and by his death on the cross, made a full atonement for all human sins, and that this atonement is the only ground of salvation, and that it is sufficient for every individual of Adam's race. The atonement is graciously efficacious for the salvation of the irresponsible and for the children in innocency, but is efficacious for the salvation of those who reach the age of responsibility only when they repent and believe. We incorporate that part of our faith has to be a big part. Has, it has to play a part in the, in the idea of salvation. We must believe that Christ's blood is enough. Amen? Like that has to happen. There are some big words in there, and I think we're going to break those down here. Uh, in just a little bit, so we can all be on the same page. Uh, So the part that said, We believe that Jesus Christ, by His sufferings, by the shedding of His own blood, by His death on the cross, made a full atonement for all human sin. That part, I think, seems fairly straightforward for us. We understand that Jesus, the divine Son of God, who took on human flesh, He suffered, bled, and died for our sin. And so now to atone for something is to make amends. To atone for something is to be reconciled uh, for that thing. And then, so last week, uh, Marcy taught us, we learned that sin primarily violates the law of love, right? Sin violates the law of love. 
What that means is sin breaks relationship. Amen? Do we we experience that? Sin breaks relationship. Because of our sin, we cannot be in right relationship with God. We cannot even approach the throne in an effort to make amends for our sins. We don't have enough. Our pockets are empty like the woman who stole the bread. We can't do it. In fact, if it weren't for God's grace, the gift of His Holy Spirit, we wouldn't even be aware of our sins or the broken relationship between us and God. Next week, Bo is going to preach on prevenient grace and what we believe about that, that God works ahead of us, that God gives us the ability to know that we are apart from Him and it's His Holy Spirit that does that. And without that, we would be lost completely. Just like the woman who stole the bread, we cannot possibly offer an atonement that would be sufficient, that would be good enough. But God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but will have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through Him. Through this generous act of God, Jesus provides the reconciliation that we need. The atonement brings that reconciliation. The repairing of broken relationship. And we also understand that the death of Jesus on the cross is the atonement for our sins. Nazarenes believe in a full atonement. I love that phrase. It is sufficient for all. Sufficient for all. As we are created in the image of God, we have the self-sovereignty. This is what we believe as Nazarenes. We have the self-sovereignty to either accept, neglect, or reject that atonement. We can can choose one of those three. And if what what we choose to do with that atonement, neglect, reject, or accept it, we do that same thing to the salvation that comes through it. Salvation comes through the atonement of Jesus Christ. And if we neglect it, if we reject it, we neglect and reject salvation as well. But if we accept the atonement of Jesus, if we accept the blood of Christ washing away our sins completely, we accept the salvation that comes through the atonement. Amen? Isn't that good news? That is fantastic news. I don't know why I didn't get a bunch of amens on that, but I'm just going to keep right on going here. We believe that this atonement is the only ground of salvation. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's the only way it happens. Those are the words of Jesus. If you don't accept His blood, dying on the cross for you, washing away your sins, you do not get to God. I'm, I'm not sorry about that. I'm sorry if you don't agree with that. But the truth is, you have to accept that your sins can only be washed clean by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. And it has been done for you. It's already happened. All you have to do is say, thank you, Jesus. I want to follow you and serve you because of your blood. I want to follow you and serve you because of what you did for me. And I absolutely believe that if we will stop and think about what Jesus went through to atone for our sins, we would make a lot fewer stupid decisions. Amen? Okay, well, that was much better, amen. I like that. That was good. So before we keep diving In here, there there are two words that we need to define. One is sufficient that we've already talked about a little bit. The other is just a word I really like to say, and that's efficacious. I love saying that word. Sufficient is defined as being as much as is needed. Some synonyms for sufficient would be enough, ample, competent. Efficacious is defined as capable of producing the desired effect. Synonyms for efficacious would be effective, able, active, useful. There's a slight but very important distinction between these two words. 
something can be sufficient enough without being efficacious, effective, useful. Christ's blood is enough for all. Can I give an amen? Amen. Amen. It is sufficient. Nothing else is needed to atone for our sins. And I want to be so clear about that. Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ is needed to atone for our sins. However, it is only efficacious. It is only effective when joined with our faith. And Paul was clear about that in Romans chapter 3. Christ's blood is enough for the unrepentant sinner. No sin is too big for Christ's blood. Aren't you glad for that today? I cannot even, I, don't, I hate thinking about the things that separated me from God. And yet Christ's blood draws me back every time. It is only effective for salvation when joined together with repentance and belief. So as we've worded that in our article of faith, the atonement is sufficient for every individual of Adam's race. The atonement is graciously efficacious for the salvation of the irresponsible. What that means, those who are not mentally capable of making a decision. So we believe that Christ's blood, the atonement, is enough and there's no necessarily belief or decision to be made if someone can't mentally make that decision. And if a person is is in that condition, they are saved. Amen? I believe that with all of my heart. There are some that teach that, similar to what the Pharisees thought about a lot of... uh, physical ailments and defects, that it's sin that causes those. And what we believe is absolutely what Jesus said to those that said, why was this man born blind? Well, did he sin or did his parents? And Jesus said, it was, they didn't sin. It's not why he's born blind. He's, he's in this condition so that the glory of God can be revealed in him. So sin is not at fault for someone's inability to choose God, to choose Jesus' blood. And so that's when in that article of faith where it says it is efficient, efficacious, it is efficient for the irresponsible. That's what it's talking about. Someone who is not a mature, responsible person to make a decision. That's what that means. And then it goes on to say it is, uh, or, uh, and for children in innocency. So all the little babies that we had up here, you know, up until a certain age, We call it the age of accountability, and it's different for each and every one of you. Some of you teenagers, I'm not sure you might still be under that. Uh, I just, we'll have to wait and see. But I'm I'm, going to guess not, though. I'm sorry. Uh, Once you can choose, right, whatever age that is, some three, some four, some five, I don't know. It's up to each kid, between each kid and God. They have a covering that they do not have to, that we don't have to worry about for them until they can make that decision. They are covered by the blood of Jesus and safe until they reach that age of accountability and lose their innocency. Okay? So teenagers, I'm sorry. Make smart choices. All right? Okay. All right. It is efficacious. It is efficient for the salvation of those who reach the age of responsibility only when they repent and believe. Such a huge part We see in this article of faith all three elements that we've talked about today. Mercy, grace, and justice. We receive mercy by the forgiveness of our sins. We receive grace through the gift of new life. Justice is still served as the penalty for sin has been paid by Jesus. Even in the atonement, we see a picture of God's nature, His holy love. He is motivated by His great love for all of us, His creation. And He intentionally seeks a way to forgive us. Aren't you glad for that? We serve a God who is trying to save us, who is giving every possibility for us to come to know Him. He's not just saying, hey, I did my part, now you suckers just got to catch up. No, He is literally every single day throwing His Holy Spirit at us through the love of each other as we take care of each other, as we take care of our community, those who are lost, who do not know Jesus, they see His love 
through our love. And that's God trying to work through us by the power of the Holy Spirit to reach people to show them that Christ's blood is enough for them if they will just come and repent and believe. God is restrained only by His own holiness, His own righteousness, and His justice. He paid the price. We are redeemed because that price bought us back. Paul clarifies this for us in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 21. Let me read this for you. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people, because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to many? Stay right there. Stay right there. The sin that Adam committed brought death for everybody. One man brought death to everybody. Jesus Christ brought salvation. One man brought salvation to everybody. It is a beautiful picture of God's plan. Go on. Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I love that passage of Scripture. It is so good. It is through Jesus Christ that every single person on this earth has a chance to be saved. And the blood that has been spilt by Jesus is enough to save us all. And so our job, through the power of the Holy Spirit, that is being poured out over us, that has infilled us, so that we can go out and tell everybody that you just need to repent and believe. That was the message of John the Baptist. That was the message of Jesus Christ as he walked the earth. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. All you have to do is repent and believe. And Jesus' blood washes everything clean. This is the great news of Jesus Christ. Sin has entered the world through the disobedience of one man. The condition of original sin causes a tendency in us to commit actual or personal sin. So sin primarily violates the law of love, breaking that relationship between us and God. Disobedience enters the world, and through that disobedience comes death. But... The good news is that we do not have to be in bondage to that sin that brings death. We can be confident in Christ's justice, mercy, and grace. 
knowing that through the humble obedience of Jesus, we can have a new life in Him. Amen? A new life. The old is gone. The new has come. What you used to be, you are not anymore. You are a brand new creation. Do we believe Galatians 2.20 or not? It is not I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Do you believe that? And do you live that out today? We're going to celebrate today with our final song. We serve a great God who loves us. Band, come on up. He is constantly acting on our behalf. He is working to redeem us so that we can be His children in right relationship with Him. We're going to sing nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And that's all we need. But you do need to join together with what God has already done for you so that the effectiveness of Christ's blood can be poured out over your entire life. You see, you can be given a gift and it can just sit in a corner. Amen? Anyone received a gift like that? Like you got an extra toaster you didn't need or something like that? And you just put it under the shelf. Right? Or maybe kids, you know, you give them a toy and they play with it for like 30 seconds. And then all of a sudden it's either broken or done and it's, and it's in the basement forever. That's what Christ's blood is to some of us today. Maybe even you, you, you had a moment and you accepted it and you were just on fire for a month. Maybe a year. Maybe a day. But all of a sudden you've lost it and that gift of Jesus' blood has lost its effectiveness because your belief has not remained where it needs to be. I love the passage of Scripture that says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. There are absolutely things that we will continue to struggle with. You are not where you need to be if you are still where you are when you came to know Jesus Christ the first time. You must grow and change and continue to be transformed into His likeness. And it's the blood of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit that takes us from where we were to where He wants us to be. Where are you at today? Have you accepted the blood of Jesus Christ so that your sins are forgiven and the grace of God has given you a brand new life? I hope so. But if you have not, today is the day that you come and you say, I want Jesus. I want his blood to just wash away my sins so that I no longer have to struggle. That the shame that I feel can be gone. And I'm not telling you that you're going to feel perfect about everything all the time. But if you, have, or if you are living a life that seeks after the Holy Spirit every single day, I promise you He will fill you up and lift you up in those moments when you are unsure because your feelings aren't lining up with your faith. And the Holy Spirit will come in and He will change you.